So we're uh, going to do a little bit of a, uh, a microphone shuffle. Uh, so you'll see that activity over there. But I want you to pay attention to the people that are going to come on the stage. Who here has ever seen Ignite Talks? Who here has ever done an Ignite Talk? OK, so those of you who raise your hand will be highly sympathetic to the people who are getting ready to take the stage. It's not an easy feat that they're going to uh, undertake. Um, each person has 20 slides. Each slide is up for 15 seconds. Uh, the uh, slides auto advance. There is no please hold on, oh wait, hey, I need a little more time. Uh, it's pedal to the metal. Um, we have one exception to that, but he's sticking to the five minute rule. Uh, and uh, let the race begin. We're going to start with Andy Deering. Uh, first, give him a hand again for being one of our major sponsors. <laughs> Boundless. Okay, hello and welcome. First Ignite Talk. Uh, glad I Googled that yesterday before uh, I sent it over, so thank you. Um, I'm here to present a project being undertaken by Mr. Connor Clark from the New York City Department of City Planning and build, to build transparency between government and citizens. Specifically, this project is aimed at community interaction surrounding the public bike lanes in New York City. Okay, one of the goals of this project is to create transparency. Transparency can be improved especially between government organizations and citizens. Openness, accountability, and honesty are all key tenets of a transparency between government and citizens. Along with transparency, communication is one of the key mediums for building awareness between government and constituents. And creatively figuring out how to communicate with citizens is key, and technology plays that part. The primary challenge most government organizations have in building transparency, at least within the geospatial sector, is with their data, and more specifically, how the data is organized and or how it is accessed. Thus, you end up with data stovepipes, which are branded as cylinders of excellence. You know what I'm talking about. There are many organizations today who are starting to adopt open data techniques and where sharing information is seen as good business practice. However, there are still quite a few stovepipes that need to be unlocked with a lack of resources or motivation to make that transition. So how do we unlock and break down stovepipes with the goal of increasing collaboration between the government and citizens? Well, that's with technology. Taking a technological approach, building a cool app, can help bridge the gap and start building a bi-directional communication pipeline. You have to keep it simple, so whatever technology application you have built between transparency needs to be simple. So the technology needs to be easy to use so government and citizens can see value and engagement. So who can be an example of that, that effort? Well, that's NYC Planning, and specifically Connor Clark. While this is not his picture, Maybe it is. Um, it does take a champion who sees the benefit of creating and disseminating technology that will gain the trust of citizens and government organizations. But Connor and the NYC city planning team are not alone in an effort to build an environment to engage citizens, specifically around bike lane information. It is a collaboration amongst three organizations to make data openly accessible and break down stovepipes through technology. So what is the best approach to start to kick off an effort like this? Start small gain feedback. Connor and his team at planning decided to embark on a pilot effort, get it? To bring together a small select set of users, technologists, geospatial professionals, and programmers to build out this platform. But Connor and the NYC planning team could not do it alone. They worked with industry and specifically GeoDecisions and Boundless to build out the platform with a common goal in mind, help in building transparency and communications around bike lanes within the community. Connor and his team took an approach to keep everything open, meaning open source technology that can be used and sharing with an organization. This model of sharing in the same spirit as open data can provide government organizations the tools they need and customize to meet their needs. However, considerations need to be made. Bike lanes data is stored within the street center line data. And while open access is all well and good, controls have to be established so citizens do not touch data that is critical to emergency management operations, but rather engage with non-critical data. Static maps like this one serve a purpose to display information at one point in time according to one individual or group. Connor and his team aim to make an interactive and dynamic experience to create a living and breathing map that paints a larger picture. But feedback was critical, component to the bike lanes project. Users could gain access to share their observations about the bike lanes with the city, and likewise, the city was able to share information about new, bike, new lanes that were under, or ones that were under construction. 
While this map might look very similar to the static map that was shown earlier, it is fundamentally different. All the data is brought together, the stove pipes are broken down between planning, do it, and DOT, and a living and breathing interface for citizens to engage. And the feedback loop was simple. A form to be able to quickly input updates about the status of bike lanes. Now the city can share whether a bike lane is under maintenance or a citizen reporting that it needs to be under maintenance can be performed. And the form, uh, and from the planning aspect, the beauty of the technology is that the record, it is recording change or change over time. History of edits are captured, helping the planning team gain deeper insights into the data and help make more informed decisions or be more proactive about future decisions that need to be made. The NYC planning team was established this platform and is looking for selected users in their pilot program. They are establishing a baseline similar to many other 311 efforts that you see around cities and how communication will be established between the government and their citizens. Ultimately, this creates a better, safer environment for writers to work through for increased transparency. Thank you. I grew up in western Nebraska, and as a child, I lived through sheer boredom on drives across the prairie. I often asked my father, when are cars ever going to fly? And he said, probably not in my lifetime, but maybe in yours. The age of film asked the same question in movies such as uh, Back to the Future or any James Bond movie that you can recall. The century has ushered in new materials, manufacturing and autonomy technologies to change the physics and economics of flight. Welcome to the new Roaring 2020s for this century. In the last century, new technology outpaced the rules of infrastructure and frankly, maps were few and far between. Horses gave way to mass-produced mechanical horses. Rules governing the street infrastructure were a pickup game of basketball. It took years for infrastructure to catch up to man's urge to drive a metal contraption. The Roaring 2020s will introduce a similar phenomenon. Today's car will be the new horse. Flying cars and jetpacks will introduce increased mobility, capacity, and efficiency in transportation. This need is largely fueled by urbanization and not my treks across western Nebraska. And just as in the 1900s, we will have to adapt. Ah, yes, urbanization. If we were an international, holy cow. <laughs> All right, let me keep going. <clears throat> Take a look at the uh, hours of congestion. By the way, get a pinch test. Four of them are in the United States, and uh, the developing nations have very little to do with this. The McKenzie Group study highlighted that due to increases in these following areas, you lose two to four percent of your GDP. Uh, solutions for urban mobility, also highlighted by, by the McKenzie Group, but I also added a few that include autonomous transit and delivery, vertical takeoff and landing, and urban flight. Get a pinch test, guys. This is coming. Solutions for urban mobility. Let's look at six major area groups that involve urban mobility. And next slide shares the fact that there are 47 major activities as we speak, moving from design prototype to successful flight and commercialization phases. Here are two, Aeromobile and Volocopter, which are in existence. The left is a Gucci four-passenger flight plane that can move to the nearest cat two or three runway near a city and it will certainly bypass every Hertz and Avis. The Volocopter already exists and is used in Dubai right now. <clears throat> it has no cabin controls whatsoever. It is not for the elite, it is for travel back and forth to airports, as well as for movement to and from the shopping mall, believe it or not. It's not coming, it exists. Here's the, Volica, or here's the Aeromobile 3.0, four passenger, an additional 300 pounds of payload along with four passengers. You park it in your garage and then go fly and see grandma for Christmas. And a few more that are coming out in foldable wings and mole rotors. On the left is Terrafugia, which was just recently purchased by a Chinese investment firm that also bought Volvo and Lotus. And on the right side is Zero and Kitty Hawk, which basically looks like a praying mantis, which was made by most of the Silicon Valley elite. 
On the left side is a Lilium jet, which is fundamentally uh, the, the sports car of the uh, vertical takeoff and landing market, and the PAL-1V, which already exists in 150 systems that are in Europe right now following European flight rules. Here's a Lilium taking off, just so that you understand that this stuff is real. It can hit 285 knots. And here's a PAL-V, which has uh, hydro-extended uh, suspension systems, an unfolding rotor and rear prop, and it has no, uh, and, and the actual uh, rotor blade has no uh, mechanical power to it. It is steered through the wind velocity uh, and the pitch angle as it flies. There are a couple of other VTOL aircraft to consider. The Joby S2, which is a spin-out of NASA in a first production out at Santa Cruz. And the Ehang 184, which is fundamentally the consumer electronics show geek magnet uh, of the past two years, which is basically a DJI drone on steroids. This is the Jetpacks and personal hovercraft. On your left is a Scorpion 3 used right now by the Dubai police hovering at 33 feet over traffic, moving at 30 knots. On the bottom is a JB-9 jetpack, which is made right here in New York City. And here's the Martin jetpack, which flies uh, at up to 3,000 feet at 80 miles an hour and carries up to 300 pounds, including being unmanned if possible, uh, currently under, under evaluation by the Defense Department and DHS. What does this all mean to the Geospatial Society? And to, to our efforts and needs, we need new visualization tools and we need to think in 3 and 4D. And we need to have planning maps and planning tools which govern every conceivable way that you can fly. This is upon us and it's going to happen. In case you're curious, the echoing in of the 2020 Olympic Games will be done by uh, the contraption that you see on the left bottom, which will be lighting the Olympic cauldron. And on the right side, <coughs> Uber is already do, has a deal with Boeing, as well as uh, the cities of Los Angeles, Dallas, and Dubai are going full tilt into flying taxis. And I encourage you all to get a pinch test, because the reality is coming faster than you are. I'm Eric Sanderson from the Wildlife Conservation Society, different than what it says in your program where it says World Conservation Society. I wish I worked for them. Um, we're based here in New York City at the Bronx Zoo. We save wildlife and wild places all around the world. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, every other living thing on Earth and besides people, um, along with this cheetah and her cubs on the Serengeti. And the point is that Everything, every living thing on the world, on the planet, needs to move just like people do. And we do it, they need to do it for the same reason, to make a living. They run, they fly, they swim, they jump over water and fly. Um, they do this because they're evolved to, to move, to get to meet their life history needs. Um, unfortunately, when they move, sometimes they come into conflict with, with people and our need to move. Um, one of those ways is through roadkill. This is a deer from Russia. About a million vertebrates are killed every year on American roads. Um, uh, in South Korea, it was 1.6 um, vertebrates per kilometer per month per year. Um, roads also have an effect on the area around them that, depending on what we're talking about, varies from 35 meters to 200 meters on the side. Uh, Roadkill, predation, barrier effects, um, hydrologic flows, pollution. Uh, roads also give access to places that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. Um, like these two guys from Madagascar that went hunting endangered lemurs, and you can see what they brought back. Um, it's really important um, the way roads in the rural areas affect uh, wild places. And of course, the fourth major way that roads affect the environment is through carbon emissions and by changing the climate, which changes the, where ecosystems are, which then changes where animals need to go. Um, uh, cars and uh, emissions from transportation are about 14% of the global emissions. And when you think about the human footprint on a global scale, as shown on this map, um, human beings already touch 83% of the land surface, 98% of the places where we can grow rice, wheat, or corn on the planet today. There is no new frontier to go to. And when you zoom in on these maps, like in the Northeast here, you can see how important roads are for structuring these, uh, these effects on the environment. 
You can see New York City. You can see the, uh, the New York Thruway. You can see the Adirondack Mountains. Um, this is our impact on the world today. So how do we get around this? And you know, many of the speakers already touched on this, but we can't just think about you know, cars, mobility in isolation. We need to think about their effects with land use and their effects with oil. This is a figure from my book uh, published a few years ago, Terra Nova, The New World After Oil, Cars, and Suburbs. And it makes many of the recommendations that you've already heard from. One of those is actually design, design cities for people thinking about the interaction distances that people need to go. And that starts from you know, the intimate distances of being very close with our family members, our loved ones. It means being efficient with our road spaces, not just thinking about one kind of transportation mode, but thinking about walking and bicycling, shared transportation. Cars, in this sense, are the least efficient way of getting people through cities, as, as was mentioned before. Um, but the cities themselves need to have density. And we need to um, create the financial incentives for density. And in my book, I suggest a density of about 10,000 people per square mile, which is about one sixth of the density of Manhattan. So not everywhere has to be Manhattan, um, but about four times or two times the density of most suburbs. And of course, if we manage this and we manage it through electrification, then we can take advantage of the tremendous uh, renewable energy resources of the, of the country, including wind energy, as shown here. Um, and then as we move out from the cities, then we need to think about how we allow wildlife and how we allow water to cross over our roads. This is a road crossing structure from Banff National Park that's designed so wildlife don't even see the road, they just come down and across. Um, this is a more heretical idea, which, which is to say that not every road we built in the past we need into the future. Sometimes we need to close roads. We need to close roads that we don't need anymore. And that's not just true for roads, it's also true for our, our built infrastructure, our buildings. I mean, this, this place, this parking lot, that old building, they don't do any good for society and they, don't, they certainly don't do any good for nature. So why do we allow them to persist? And the people, when they pulled out of this thing, they should have tore it down. They should have torn it down and returned the land back to nature. Um, because roadless areas, places without nature, are the, the best metric we have for supporting nature. Um, on every measure you can find, large intact places are better for the kind of things that nature does that allows our lives to, to be here and to be supported. Um, you know, nature provides clean water, clean air, builds soil, and provides beauty and inspiration, which is actually at the core of what it means to be a human being. It's great to make a lot of money, it's great to move around, but what are we really here for if not to enjoy and appreciate things like this and to allow not just ourselves, but other critters on the planet to move around as well? Mobility is not just for people, it's for wildlife too. Thank you very much. Uh, afternoon, evening. Uh, I'm Anna Van Etten. I work for a small lab called Cosmic Works. It's a uh, part of InQtel, which is a strategic investor for the intelligence community. Uh, and We've been focused on a lot of projects, but one of them is SpaceNet, which is putting a whole corpus of data out there, labeled data, uh, satellite imagery of uh, buildings initially, and now roads. And going forward, we're gonna try and take a look at uh, what can we actually derive from satellite images with regard to routing and roads. Uh, so initially, we had uh, buildings. Uh, going forward, we have 8,000 kilometers of roads in four different cities. Uh, this is all public. Uh, uh, very soon, and uh, I encourage people to go look at this when it's released. So kind of the challenge we have is uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons to do routing, right? I don't need to motivate the, the room here. Uh, a lot of work on cities, a lot of talk about cities today. Uh, let's consider a different kind of scenario where it's a natural disaster, right? This, this will continue to happen, and all your hyper-networked infrastructure is down. Uh, what can you do? Well, kind of the premise that we have is Satellite imagery and the rapid revisits of constellations might help you kind of uh, fill in the gaps there from your terrestrial infrastructure that might be down. Uh, again, lots of reasons you might do this. Keep going. Uh, this here is just a snapshot of kind of the uh, humanitarian open street map, uh, current campaigns that are open just for, just for mapping uh, the different roads. There's still a lot of need currently, and that will only continue as we get more and more disasters, I think, going forward. Current techniques, uh, we obviously all use Google Maps. Uh, but this is incomplete in the sense that uh, it relies on GPS pings usually. OpenStreetMap is a great resource, but uh, it's incomplete and there are, of course, errors. Uh, and then on to kind of the analytics. So this is the piece that we're kind of focused on. Is, uh, this is a kind of the, what you might get currently, which is on the left you have 
a solid image, and you might put it through some kind of deep learning framework, and you get out a, a road mask on the right there. And this is useful. A lot of people have, have done this kind of thing, both automated and manually, but uh, there's kind of a lack of utility here. So can we actually take this Im image on the right and get something more useful out of it, which would be an actual network of a road? Uh, and kind of one thing that we've focused really heavily on is, especially when you're doing analytics, right, your evaluation metric is crucial. Uh, and uh, this often takes a lot of thought if we're trying to push the envelope. And so kind of traditionally what you do is you look at the pixels that are present and you score it based on that. And uh, just one example here, so the left is ground truth. Um, say the orange in the middle is one proposal and the right's another proposal. And if your standard scoring techniques, uh, you'd score the middle one better. Uh, or you score it worse, actually even though that's connected. Uh, and then the one on the right, you'd say, oh, well, uh, it looks pretty good because the road bits are close, but uh, we missed the connection. So if you're trying to route, this is terrible, but current scoring techniques would say this is actually a pretty good, pretty good prediction. Uh, so we spent a lot of time kind of trying to develop a new metric to score uh, this type of, of algorithm, uh, and that's kind of what we're going to use going forward. Um, and I'll skip through a lot of the details. The gist is, that instead of just looking at the pixels of this mask, you're looking at the different routes and looking at how those path links differ across the different map. Again, it's summing up the difference in route links. I'll blow through this a little bit quickly because I know we're short on time. Uh, there's a lot of kind of subtleties involved here, um, but if you are careful about how you select different nodes to compare, you can get a reasonable uh, way to do this. And finally, what you get is you have this score that compares different routes and and you can figure out how well did I actually reproduce this ground truth roadmap uh, from this image. Uh, and so this is kind of a proposal that you might, you might see currently from techniques that would say, given an image, can you give me out a roadmap? Uh, so top left is the image. Maybe you make that into a mask. You run it through a deep learning algorithm, and you get out some kind of um, mask on the bottom. We take that. Uh, turn it into uh, lines, refine that, and this is our proposal. Uh, and then we can compare the different scoring methods. Again, there's an advantage to using uh, kind of graph theory versus pixels. Uh, and so here's kind of some uh, kind of more concrete example of, of what you have. Top left is the ground truth, uh, and then top right, say this is a proposal. You refine it in the bottom left, and then bottom right is it's actual uh, a graph structure. So you could use this to route. Um, and here's a few, uh, a few more examples uh, of, of what you can actually get with this type of approach. Uh, so again, we have a background image from satellites. And then the bottom right is what we predict for the road. So if you're trying to route around here, um, this is a technique you could actually use. And again, uh, just more examples. Uh, and kind of the, the, the thought is, right, these, these algorithms currently, this is a, a prototype. Uh, we're going to have a competition around this. And so we'll see if other people have other ideas. And the data will be out there so people can further kind of refine these ideas. Uh, there's other data you can incorporate, right? So obviously GPS is uh, something that we use a lot. Uh, this is another data set that will potentially, potentially be released. Uh, so finally, what we're trying to do, right? Bottom left, we have an image. We're trying to turn that into a road network. Uh, I've showed some examples of how you might do this. Uh, and the hope is, right, that uh, a lot of people out there will have access to this different evaluation criteria, as well as um, all this data, and will kind of push people towards going from just solid imagery to actually a usable product, which is a road network. Thank you. of you know what this is? This is a street in Hong Kong viewed through the eyes of a machine distilled precisely into segments that make sense. So traffic lights, car, lane marking, crosswalks. This is called semantic segmentation, and this is computer vision technology today. Go. So back in 1956, we thought cars would drive themselves differently. We thought they'd have electronic trackers embedded in the roads, and they'd go. But we've done a lot better. We've actually built eyes for cars, basically a broad array of sensors that helps them sense and um, realize what's, what's around them to make better maps. 
So the challenge today is how do we create better maps with 700 trillion images captured every day from cars? And how do we make them so that they're complete, accurate, and fresh, so that they're effective when your car is just about to turn into the bike lane that wasn't there yesterday? How we get there is how we got here today with rapid strides in computer vision and fast improvements in um, hardware and cameras. So you guys know this as a device to actually consume maps. It can actually be a device to make maps as well. So let's say you're walking around and you're a sensor on a vehicle and you're capturing imagery continually. Those rectangular frames represent the position of the image in the 3D space. And what you're doing is you can actually match the points to create 3D reconstructions of the space so much so that I can now tell you the position of that tree. But how does the car know it's a tree? So we go from Hong Kong back to, to Moscow now, and again you're seeing semantic segmentation in action. Tree, utility pole, all done with machine vision. So this combination of semantic segmentation and 3D reconstruction now gives you an automated workflow for generating map data fast. So this is sidewalk density and traffic signs positioned and placed in San Francisco within minutes of actually hitting our cloud. So on a larger scale, let's go to the city of Amsterdam, which released 800,000 3D, uh, high, high resolution 360 images of the city and brought them to our platform to create a dense 3D point cloud. Um, and you can actually see the semantic segmentation colored in. So we now have this giant treasure trove of imagery and data that we've extracted from Amsterdam, bridges, billboards, crosswalks, tunnels, traffic lights. And we have this all just based on imagery that we actually process within days. So not quite real time, but getting there. And that's where we want to go with computer vision. Which brings me to my next point about collaboration and how it drives new maps. So the spirit of OpenStreetMap has spread beyond itself as commercial maps realize that the world is too big to map on your own. We believe the answer to this lies again in computer vision by enabling a sensor agnostic approach. If you support sensors from any vehicle, and if you empower anyone with any device anywhere to create maps, you're basically setting up an operation that scales to create the most complete map of the world today. So, um, the proof is in our numbers. At Mapillary, we've amassed over 200 million images today. And um, to visually demonstrate this, I am actually going to show you my favorite one. That was Antarctica, but back to urban mobility. So this is a, a snapshot of the here tool used to actually edit um, here maps. They're commercial maps with Mapillary imagery. This supplements their in-house data that's actually collected by their uh, fleet of street view cars. And the question is why? To get more data. So when here uses our imagery, what they're getting is access to data contributed by many others. So for example, they get local governments who use the S3 suite, OpenStreetMap, and other commercial mappers who are actually out there collecting imagery alone. So it's a two-way relationship. What here does is it contributes imagery back to the community. So if you look at the shot of Astana, the swell of data since we started working with here, this is in Kazakhstan, now available to anyone who wants to make better maps everywhere. But Better maps everywhere should really mean better maps for everyone. So as our eyes are trained towards development in the automotive industry, um, what we need to realize is that communities and individuals actually point us towards addressing challenges beyond the car. So um, what we've learned at Mapillary is that individuals are incredibly passionate and motivated about very specific interests. So local pride, bike safety, infrastructure development in your town, and the epitome of this type of motivation and passion are, are events like um, this. This is a pedestrian event bringing together people who are able-bodied and people who have uh, limited mobility to traverse the streets of Mexico City in wheelchairs to experience it together. So the imagery that we collected, you can see smartphones attached to some of the handlebars. The imagery we collected, curb cuts, sidewalks, crosswalks, these can now be used to actually create better maps for uh, limited mobility routes. So human empathy, powered by computer vision, uh, helps to create better maps in Mexico City by showing what it's like to actually uh, walk around in Mexico City in a wheelchair. So I'll leave you with this. I am very fortunate to work in the company of those who actually push the boundaries of machine intelligence every day. But um, I'm constantly reminded of how the future of mobility actually is in the hands and the uh, hearts of humans making more effective and equitable maps. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, so I'm here today to talk to you about augmented reality uh, and the fact that in reality, uh, everything is grounded in space and time. And uh, augmented reality is, is uh, no different. And fundamentally, it's going to be changing the way that we interact with the world. Starting, starting with a, a quick quote from augmented reality's newest fanboy, Mr. Tim Cook. Uh, according to him, not long ago, a significant portion of the population of developed countries, uh, and eventually all countries, are going to be having augmented reality experiences every day. So what is AR, augmented reality? I'm sure that everybody in the room has heard that term before. Um, quite simply, it is the idea of uh, placing digital information in the context of the world that we actually live in and interact in, in the physical world. So you've probably seen a number of uh, kind of the, the pioneers in the commercial sector. On the left-hand side, we have the Microsoft HoloLens. On the right-hand side, we have everybody's favorite uh, traffic-causing device, Pokemon Go. Uh, these are very commercial applications that are, are driving some of the things on the game side of the world. Uh, and right now, that commercial implementation and a lot of those uh, games are really driving where the hardware development is going. And the reality is that hardware is moving forward really, really fast. I, it's hard for me to imagine where we are today, given where we were two years ago. In that context, mobility apps, so outside of games, mobility apps are actually uh, some of the, the biggest drivers of where the, the technology overall for augmented reality is going. Uh, a couple of uh, very notable examples of this come in the form of, on that left-hand side there, the guy looking like a uh, crazed beetle. That's the $400,000 helmet that currently occupies the cockpit of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. On the right-hand side, slightly more affordable, not quite so much, uh, the BMW's latest heads-up display system where they're actually uh, taking map data and overlaying it in the scene in front of you as you're driving. In these scenarios, you have two kind of predominant classes of, of these applications. You have an active one where you have a device that's actively sensing the world around you and uh, in real time registering digital content into that world. And you have the passive version, um, more like Pokemon Go, where you're using map data and registering against a, a location that you are measuring yourself. Underlying both of these applications is the recognition that the world actually is three-dimensional, it turns out. And not only is it three-dimensional, it's like really three-dimensional. This is kind of a very simple uh, application demonstration of an augmented reality app, but it highlights a key problem. So in order for that augmented reality app to be able to point you to the Galaxy Cafe that happens to be on the 10th floor of that building, first, you need data that actually tells you that the Galaxy Cafe is on the 10th floor in that building, right? So the future as we're moving forward is towards blending these two capabilities together. So real-time sensing, i.e. understanding of your relative position in the world, uh, with uh, data that is actually referenced and registered in absolute space. So how is all of that going to happen? So it's not just magic. The, there's work that has to be done in, in our industry and in the technology industry as, as well. The key to making this happen is that we're going to need extremely accurate three-dimensional foundational information to build out our a priori understanding of the world that we live in. To go with the real-time sensors to be able to augment where we are in the world through various devices that we interact with on, on a daily basis and accurate location-based information of digital content and ourselves in the world. So what? What does that really mean? Well, the, the reality is, and it's, it's interesting, I'm going to borrow a quote from one of my good friends, Mr. Jeff Jonas, who many of you in the, the room probably know, but the reality is that commercial industry is coming to the recognition that where and when X, Y, Z, and T are the most important bits of information in any data set today. The people in this room are intimately familiar with uh, how important those pieces of data are. The rest of the commercial industry is getting there, but all of this has to be tied back into the real, true, three-dimensional and four-dimensional world that we live in. So uh, myself, I'm on, I am excited every day to work at a company that is going out and actually trying to tackle at least one of those problems, building the highest resolution, most accurate 3D map of the face of the planet uh, and hosting it live as a web service so people can actually use it. Um, but it's going to take a lot of participation from the rest of the community to get to a 
the, the future that we have seen in Hollywood for so long, which is really, truly right at the tip of our fingertips today. And with that, drink. <laughs> <laughs>